My name is Jennifer. I'm 21 years old and I work at a Walmart in Phoenix, Arizona. Since I don't go to school full-time, my boss would often put me on an overnight shift when the store was open 24 hours a day, given that it was a super center there. I never minded working overnight, really. The store was always dead between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., so it gave me time to get my area looking good before the morning rush started. One night around 3 a.m., I was stocking some shelves in the toy section. This section of the store was pretty isolated, especially at this time of night. As I was placing some boxes on the shelves, I heard footsteps approaching from behind me. I turned around expecting to see a fellow employee, but no one was there. The footsteps continued, getting louder and louder. My heart began racing as I frantically looked around but couldn't see anyone. The footsteps were right behind me now. I spun around. Hello, is someone there? No response. Suddenly I felt a hand firmly grab my shoulder. I screamed and jumped back. An old man was standing there, staring at me. His clothes were dirty and he looked confused. Sorry, miss. Didn't mean to scare you, he mumbled. I asked if he needed any help finding anything, but he just shuffled away without responding. Thoroughly creeped out, I decided to take my break early. I went to the break room and told my co-worker Paul what had happened. He laughed and told me that it was probably just Hank. I should not worry about him because he was harmless, just a lonely old man who wanders around here at night sometimes. But this didn't make me feel much better. Later, I was working in the clothing section folding shirts when I noticed Hank shuffling down the aisle toward me. He walked right up to me and just stood there staring at me. I asked Hank if he needed some help finding anything, but he didn't respond. He just kept staring with a blank expression. I smiled nervously and said, Okay then, I'll just keep working, and I told him to let me know if he needed anything. I tried to ignore him, but having this creepy old man stand there watching my every move was unnerving. His piercing eyes followed me as I moved around the aisle. After what felt like forever, he finally turned and walked away without saying a word. The rest of the night continued like this. Hank lurked around every area I worked in. He would silently stand near me, following me when I walked away. When I was covering the register up front, I looked over to see Hank standing at the end of the aisle, just watching me. My shift was almost over when I was paged to the clothing section for a spill cleanup. As I headed down the dark, deserted aisle, my nerves were on high alert. When I got to the spill, Hank was already standing there waiting for me. As I kneeled to start cleaning up the detergent, the smell of rotting flesh overcame me. I gagged and looked around, wondering if some meat had gone bad. That's when I noticed a smell trail leading around the corner. I slowly followed the putrid smell which got stronger the further I walked. I turned the corner and shrieked in horror. The source of the smell was a mutilated dead body leaning against the shelves. By the torn Walmart vest and name tag, I could tell it was Paul, my co-worker. His abdomen was sliced open with organs spilling out, and blood was smeared all over the floor. I was frozen in shock when I heard a chilling male voice behind me, asking me if I liked his work. I whipped around to see Hank standing there with a bloody knife in his hand and a crazed look in his eyes. Before I could react, he was on me. He tackled me to the ground, knocking the wind out of me. I fought with all my might as he slashed the knife at me. I managed to kick him off and stagger to my feet. Adrenaline coursing through me, I sprinted down the aisle, screaming for help. I could hear Hank's deranged laughter getting closer behind me. Just as I made it to the front of the store, everything went black. The last thing I remembered was Hank's wicked smile as he swung the knife down at my head. I slowly opened my eyes, feeling dazed and disoriented. As my blurry vision came into focus, I realized I was in some kind of basement. It was dark and damp, with only a single flickering light bulb dangling from the ceiling. I tried to move, but quickly realized I was bound to a chair. My wrists and ankles were tied tightly with coarse rope, and my mouth was covered with duct tape. Fear washed over me as the events that transpired flashed through my mind. Hank had attacked me, and I assumed kidnapped me and brought me to this basement. I struggled against my restraints, but it was no use. I couldn't break free. Suddenly I heard footsteps coming down creaky wooden stairs. My heart pounded as Hank appeared, grinning wickedly at me. In his hands was a large blood-stained knife. There you are, my dear. I was hoping you'd wake up soon. We're going to have so much fun, he said in a sinister tone. He slowly approached me, gliding the knife lightly across my cheek and down my neck. I whimpered through the duct tape pleading with my eyes for him to let me go, and he told me this will only hurt for a moment. He forcefully grabbed my hair and yanked my head to the side, fully exposing my neck. I braced myself as he raised the knife above me. 
Just as he was about to slash my throat, the basement door flew open. Blinding light flooded the basement, and I heard a yelling, Police, drop your weapon! Within seconds, two officers raced down the stairs, tackling Hank to the ground. The knife slipped from his grasp and went sliding across the floor. The officers wrestled Hank into handcuffs while reading him his rights. We received an anonymous tip about suspicious activity here, one explained as they hauled Hank up the stairs. Soon paramedics arrived and carefully removed my restraints and tended to me. Hank had only managed to inflict minor cuts on me before the police arrived. I was in shock but flooded with relief. As I was escorted into the ambulance, I saw two bodies being wheeled out on stretchers covered in white sheets. Paul was one of the victims, but I did not recognize the other. I later learned Hank had murdered at least six people who had the misfortune of crossing his path at night. My terrifying ordeal was finally over, thanks to that anonymous tip. I never returned to my overnight stocking job at Walmart. The hunt for Hank, as the media called it, was now in the hands of the police, but I'll forever be traumatized by the deranged murderer who still haunts my nightmares. Working the night shift at Walmart as a night stock person on the weekends was my first job after finishing college. I needed the extra money, and the flexible hours allowed me to still focus on my classes during the week. At first, working overnights in the large, empty store seemed creepy, but I eventually got used to it. My co-workers and I would spend the shifts listening to music on our headphones as we stocked shelves and organized inventory in the back. One night, however, things took a terrifying turn. It started as a typical 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. overnight shift. My manager had called out sick, so I and two other stockers were working that night. Around 2 a.m., my co-worker Dan took his lunch break while Mike and I continued working in separate parts of the cavernous store. About a half hour later, I was stocking pet supplies when the overhead lights suddenly shut off, plunging the store into complete darkness. The silence was eerie. No music playing, no footsteps, nothing. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight, scanning the pitch-black aisles around me. I called out Mike and Dan, but no one answered. Heart pounding, I quickly walked towards the front of the store, hoping the other two were playing some prank. But the entire store was empty. No sign of Dan or Mike anywhere. I tried calling them, but it went straight to voicemail. Starting to freak out, I went to check the employee break room, hoping maybe Dan had fallen asleep on his lunch. But the room was empty. As I turned to leave, the motion sensor light suddenly came back on. Relief washed over me for a second before I froze. On the wall next to the door was a huge blood smear dripping down towards the floor. I gasped and staggered backward. What the hell was happening? My mind raced, unsure what to do next. I had to get out of there. Darting down the aisles towards the main entrance, my sneakers squeaked on the shiny linoleum floor. My heart thudded as I went to push open the front doors, but they wouldn't budge. Someone had locked them from the outside. Banging frantically on the doors did nothing. I was trapped. Spinning around, I searched for another escape route. The loading dock. I could sneak out the back. Running through storage, I scrambled to unlock the heavy door leading outside. Fresh air never smelled so sweet. I sprinted across the delivery area towards my car, fumbling to unlock it with shaky hands. As I went to open the door, a blood-curdling scream pierced the silence coming from inside the store. It was Dan's voice, I was sure of it. Against my better judgment, I left my car and ran back inside, following the screams towards the hardware department. In the gardening section, I found Dan curled up on the floor, clutching his stomach. Dark blood soaked through his Walmart vest. He whimpered. I should help him. I knelt down, applying pressure to the wound. I asked him in a panic, what happened and where was Mike? Dan opened his mouth to speak, but only more blood came out. His eyes rolled back as his body went limp. I shook him desperately, but he was gone. A noise at the end of the aisle made me whip my head around. A dark figure stood there, holding something long and metal. The smell of iron flooded my senses as the object glinted under the lights. A blood-stained machete. This was no prank gone wrong. We were dealing with a killer inside Walmart. I jumped up, running and weaving through the aisles. My legs burned as I pushed myself to the limit, hearing the scrape of the blade behind me as the assailant followed close behind. I ducked into the garden center, crawling beneath the displays and plants. My breathing was ragged, on the verge of hyperventilating. I could hear footsteps entering the garden center as I hid behind a tower of fertilizer bags. Peering through them, I could see the masked murderer stalking the aisles, a machete dangling from their grip. Knowing I couldn't stay hidden forever, I glanced around desperately for a makeshift weapon. 
Nearby sat a display of rakes, shovels, and other tools. I grabbed the heaviest rake I could find, clutching the wooden handle like a bat. As the killer's back was turned, I burst from my hiding spot and swung with all my might. The metal rake's head collided with their shoulder in a sickening crack. They cried out in pain and anger. Adrenaline pumped through me as I swung the rake again and again, driving the killer back through the aisles. With one final blow, I knocked the machete from their hand and sent it clattering away. Not waiting around, I bolted once more towards the front entrance, which now stood open. I heard police sirens in the distance, cutting through the chilly night air. Bursting through the doors, I collapsed in the parking lot as flashing lights appeared down the street. The police arrived to find one employee dead, one injured, and a deranged murderer apprehended inside thanks to a brave college kid and a rake. I gave my witness statement in a daze, still trembling from my close call. After that hellish night, I put in my two weeks' notice. Never again would I work the overnight shift at Walmart.'